Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. How often do we hear the complaint, Lord, what did I do that you should let me suffer like this? The powerful women that we're studying about embraced the cross of Jesus. They found their purification through the cross, the Eucharist, and Mother Mary. The saint we're going to share with you today was one of those saints. They say there is a saint somewhere for all of us. St. Clair of Montefalco is one of those saints. Clair adored and carried the cross of Jesus, confident that she could trust in him and his promise to her. I pray that our beloved St. Clair will be for you what she has been for us, truth in a world that encourages lies, hope in a world that promotes hopelessness. Our little saint was born in 1268, one of four children. Three years later, her oldest sister, Joanna, established a hermitage. Joanna was 20 years old when she and her friends set out to live a life of prayer and sacrifice. In 1274, it was granted approval by the church authorities. Joanna was then allowed to receive candidates. Who do you think would be her <laughs> first candidate? none other than her sister Clara, all of six years old. Mm. Clara was a very alive little girl whom everyone found genuine, perceptive, and sensible beyond her years, as well as extremely lovable. From the be very beginning, though she was much younger, she kept up with her two companions spiritually, prayerfully, and penitentially, almost surpassing the mortification practiced by the others. Claire always had a burning love for our Lord Jesus, especially in his passion. In 1278, with more and more girls requesting admittance into their company, it was soon evident they needed larger quarters. After prayer and fasting, they decided to move to a hill nearer to the town. Some townspeople, for selfish reasons, did not want this little raggedy band of nuns to come closer to them. The reason they gave was that the town could not support another community that subsisted on arms. It would be too much of a drain on the people. The dissenters called for a meeting of the town council. They demanded that the part of the hermitage that had been constructed be torn down. But as God is just, so is he powerful. The authorities voted in favor of the little band of women and the hermitage was saved. The hostility leveled at the little community of women turned into wholesale oppression, sporting lies, uh, malicious gossip, and when that failed, acts of violence. All attempts at terrorizing the young women failed to force them to abandon their dream. Holed up in a house with its roof half completed, wet, cold, and hungry, the little band of apostles was sustained by their faith and calling, which was stronger than any persecution the townspeople could impose on them. Joanna finally obtained permission to send some of the sisters begging for alms. Claire, although barely 15 years old, pleaded to be the first one to beg. Her persistence wore down her sister's objections, and Claire was on her way. Her face covered by a veil, barefoot, she journeyed in faith across the countryside, extending her little hand from under her cloak. She offered thanks on her knees, accepting humbly and good-naturedly all that was handed her, which more often than not were wounding words rather than arms. The sisters had to stop her from begging after a while as she was extremely beautiful and it was not uncommon for defenseless young women to become victims of violence even in those days. Her 40 days of begging at an end, Claire was to spend the rest of her life as a cloistered nun inside the convent, never to leave it again. Claire used to spend eight to 10 hours a day or more in prayer, some nights falling down on her knees as many as a thousand times reciting the Lord's Prayer. As she walked with our Lord through his passion, she pleaded to help him carry his cross. Claire strove for a deeper form of prayer that called for self-denial and deep contemplation. It seemed like she was beginning to reach that union of complete oneness when God put an end to it. 
Claire was having an engaging conversation with another sister when the enemy of pride surfaced and she gave into it. Was her sharing mixed with a little pride in the form of bragging at the Lord having chosen her specially? Claire was to go into the desert, besieged by all sorts of temptations, a victim of emotional highs plummeting into spiritual lows. Claire was afraid that her God had left her. She was alone. It was 1288. Claire was 20 years old. All the crosses she was to carry in the future could not equal that of the pain she was suffering, not hearing or feeling her Lord. This torture went on for 11 years, and so many of the lives of the saints, Claire's included, they were to know that loneliness that surpasses all the other, that dreadful silence of God. As Claire confessed her sins, seeking direction and penance for her faults, her confessors instead extolled her virtues. Mm. Without the spiritual assistance she so desperately sought, Claire carried the burden of her feelings of unworthiness in her heart. As she did not receive her desired penances, she imposed them on herself to the point where her sister had to step in. Joanna, along with the doctors, ordered her to stop and to moderate her discipline. As it would appear, Claire was all alone and misunderstood. Could it be that God took this time with her in the desert to toughen her, to prepare her for his work, his mission for her, which would continue even after her death? The hermitage finally became a monastery. The little band of hermits was required to adopt one of the established rules of the church. They chose the rule of St. Augustine, that is to live a shared life, with one mind, one spirit, one heart centered in God. In short, to be what we are all called to be, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The rule was granted to them by the Bishop of Spoleto on June 10th, 1290. What began as a small raggedy remnant of hermits became a community of nuns, sisters of the Holy Cross. For the last 700 years, they have faithfully followed the rule of St. Augustine. In November 1291, Claire's sister Joanna went to dwell with her Lord and Master Jesus in heaven. For Claire, the death of her sister caused her pain unlike anything she had ever experienced. The nuns were puzzled why she was so upset at the death of her sister when she had not been at the deaths of her parents. She replied, how is it you do not understand? I weep neither for her soul or her body, but only for myself. Joanna was to me an example and a mirror of life. Every day she spoke to me of God. For this I weep, for nothing else. The bishop's representative arrived for the election of a new abbess. The nuns unanimously chose Claire. She wept, feeling totally unworthy, and begged them to choose someone else. She asked the nuns to present her petition to the bishop, stating that she was unqualified spiritually and totally lacking the necessary wisdom to be abbess. To her dismay, they refused. I think that all the saints teach us one important lesson. God uses who they are to do his work on earth. Whenever we wonder, why us? The answer we get is, because I chose you. No other reason. Yes, there are many more worthy than you, but I've chosen you. Now just say yes, and let's get on with it. Although Claire felt unworthy and suffered great in a turmoil, she accepted her responsibilities as abbess and became mother, teacher, and spiritual director to her sisters. Sensitive to those who felt called to more prayer, she allowed them to pursue it but with the, the condition that everybody did manual work. Like another powerful woman we have written about, our mother Angelica, Claire personally directed each and every one of her nuns. As we study the history of our beloved church and that of the world, we discover how much influence the world has on the church. The time of Claire was filled with the mighty and the meek, the persecutors and the persecuted, 
the poor with much too little and the rich with much too much. Honesty was overshadowed by lies. Wars were fought, treaties made and broken, knowledge by the few and the ignorance of the many, life-giving mystical love and deadly crippling lust. Magisterium and heresy were all signs of the battle the never-ending choice of Christ or Barabbas. The restlessness we are suffering right now, they too thought they could not endure. And so in these times, God in his mercy sends us a St. Clair of Montefalco. God wastes nothing, not a tear, not a doubt, not a hope, not a disappointment, nothing. Claire was able to minister to people outside the community who came to her. As she had struggled with inner doubts, she was able to talk with authority to others, having fought in a battlefield not unlike theirs. By her genuine love and care, Claire was able to attract to the monastery of the Holy Cross bishops and priests, friars and theologians, judges and lawyers, the learned and the unlearned, people, uh, lay people and religious, saints and sinners. From an early age, Claire had made the decision not to look at men or to allow them to look at her. Only her friar brother Francesco was the exception. We wonder if it might have been because she knew how easy it would be to be subtly suckered away from our Lord. Claire knew herself. She said, if God does not protect me, I would be the worst woman in the world. Whatever her reasoning, Claire spoke to everyone who came to her for advice from behind the black curtain grill. This, however, did not stifle the passion, the zeal which, with which she spoke to her visitors. Her words, so filled with the God she loved, were not above their heads, but so down to earth. The simplest of people could not fail to understand her all felt she was speaking individually to them. Without any scholarly knowledge, but with the never-ending wisdom of Scripture and the faith of our fathers, Claire was able to counsel all who came to her to such a degree that they came from far and wide for her spirit-filled advice. Claire always gave to the poor. Her brother Francesco, who, whom she had sent out hundreds of times with food and provisions for the poor, testified that Claire, although actually very poor, appeared at times wealthy. Mm -hmm. Writing about the powerful women of the church has been a very humbling experience. We know scripture says, love your enemies, that even the pagans love their friends. But the living of that must be what makes saints like St. Claire. She gave to friends and enemies equally, if not more to enemies. It is reported she gave the most to those who had hurt her, who had spread malicious lies about her. The year 1294 was a turning point for Claire. The Christmas of the past year had found her quite ill. This had been compounded by a deep interior crisis. Judging herself lacking in gratitude for all God had given her, Claire attributed the spiritual dryness she felt as God withholding his divine presence from her because of her sinfulness. On the Feast of the Epiphany, she went into ecstasy, remaining in this state for several weeks. During that journey away from the world, Claire had a vision. She saw Jesus coming towards her as a poor pilgrim, his face, weary from the weight of the cross, his body showing the outward signs of the long, hard journey carrying the cross. Claire tried to keep him from going any further, pleading, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, I have searched the whole world for a strong place to plant firmly my cross, and I have not found it. Claire looked up to Jesus, her hands outstretched, touching the cross, expressing all the years of longing to share Jesus' cross. Our Lord's face changed from gaunt with exhaustion to beaming with love and joy. His journey was over. He said, Claire, here I have found a place for my cross. At last, 
someone I could trust with my cross, mm -hmm. and he thrust it into her heart. Claire shared this vision with a cousin seven years later. The excruciating pain she felt in her entire body upon receiving the cross remained with her. From that moment, she was always keenly aware of the cross she could not only feel, but sense with every fiber of her being. In spite of frail health, she continued to work as abbess to her sisters and missionary to those who came from outside the cloister. She did this unceasingly, never taking care of herself until July of 1308, when she could no longer rise from her bed. Some years before, her brother had summoned a prominent physician to visit her. She would not allow the other nuns to see or touch her body, no less a doctor. He had prescribed medicine for her, but she never took any of it. Now another doctor offered his services. He differed from the previous doctor in that he was more concerned with her ecstasies than with her physical ills. He told the nuns there was no medicine that could remedy the weakness caused by these ecstasies. He told them to distract Claire, take her mind off her ecstasy. He meant well, but he didn't know Claire. The determination that had brought her through all the persecution was the same that would not allow anyone to keep her from her Lord. She didn't want to be called a saint. When some of her nuns couldn't help but blurt out, you're a saint, she would sharply reply, cast me away, cast me away. While they thought she was being humble, she was really in agony, fighting the enemy, sensing his strong presence. He attacked in his usual way as with the saints before her, that she was unworthy of God, that he did not find it pleasing. She had been wrong in all that she had done, leading many astray and on and on, her shepherd beside her, with all the faith of those before her, she answered the devil, I do not want to give you what is yours, nor do I want anything from you. You are accursed for thousands of years, and I curse you still. On the evening of August the 15th, she called the nuns together and left them their spiritual last will and testament. I offer my soul and all of you the death of Lord Jesus Christ. Be blessed by God and by me. And I pray, my daughters, that you behave well and that all the work God has had me do for you be blessed. Be humble, obedient. Be such women that God may always be praised through you. When a nun is dying, each of the sisters make a sign of the cross on her. As they attempted to do so to Claire, she gently but firmly protested over and over again, why do you sign me, my sisters? I have the crucified Jesus in my heart. Friday, late in the afternoon, she called for her brother, Francesco. That night, when he arrived, he found his sister very tired. But the next morning, the doctor told him Claire had slept well and was resting comfortably. Francesco was about to leave when he was called back by two of the nuns. He followed them into her bedroom. She appeared completely recovered, was sitting up at the edge of the bed. Her color was back in her face. She was smiling, looking as well, so well that he suggested they get her something to eat. She gave her brother some spiritual direction, talking at great length with him. As much joy and a mood of anticipated celebration began to spread among the nuns in Francisco, Claire turned to the chaplain of the monastery. I confess to God and you my faults, all my offenses. A little later, turning to a nun, she said, now I have nothing more to say to you. You are with God because I am going to him. She remained like that, seated upright in her bed, her eyes turned toward heaven, not moving, without even the smallest quiver. Francesco took his sister's pulse. He turned to the nuns circled about the bed and announced, tears running down his face, she is dead. The doctor teased Francesco and the nuns, believing Claire had gone into ecstasy again. He took her pulse himself, 
Having done so, he agreed she was gone, and he too broke into tears. A good friend was dead. Was sure that Mary, the mother of God, was there, waiting to bring this faithful daughter to her spouse, who had a place ready for her in his father's mansion. The funeral mass was celebrated the next day. The preacher, who was a Franciscan preach, gave the mass uh, as a favor to her brother Francesco. Instead of giving the homily he had prepared, he found himself delivering the most extraordinary eulogy. These were words he hadn't planned on using. As the words poured from his lips, he came to realize that he was eulogizing a saint. That evening, the nuns opened her heart, preparing to place it in a reliquary. To their amazement, Jesus' words came alive. Yes, Claire, here I have found a place for my cross. At last, someone I could trust with my cross. There before them were the marks of Jesus' passion. Cradled inside the softness of a grand heart was the perfect form of Jesus crucified, even to the crown of thorns, clearly evidenced on his head, and the lance wound in his precious side. The Lord had not only planted his crucified body within the recesses of a heart, but the painful evidence of some of his sufferings, the means of flagellation in the form of ligaments or tendons. News of the miracle spread, but one of her old adversaries denounced the nuns, claiming their findings were willfully misrepresented. He went to the vicar of Montefalco, who went on to, Mon to Montefalco, to, uh, and he called together theologians, lawyers, and doctors. The heart was carefully investigated, and they all unanimously concluded the marks were not of an explainable scientific nature or of human understanding. In other words, it was a miracle. Another miraculous sign was the finding of three stones inside her bladder. They were the signs of large uh, hazelnuts, perfectly equal in size, color, shape, and weight. They were found to weigh all the same, one weighing the same as two, Two, the same as three. The sisters at the shrine tell us this sign was left to show the love St. Clair had for the Blessed Trinity. St. Clair's body exuded such a sweet fragrance. The nuns tell us that they could never bury her in the ground. Her body is still visible nearly 700 years later, never having decomposed, and is said to be supple. Rigor mortis never set in. There's an interesting thing that happens when we bring pilgrims to the shrine. In the garden, there is a tree. St. Clair had a vision of our Lord Jesus where he told her to take a dead stick and plant it in the ground. Out of obedience and great respect for him, she did this, and she watered it. The dead stick blossomed forth into little nuts that the sisters use to make rosaries out of Till today. Till today, they take these rosaries and they send them to all the Augustinian convents all over the world. In addition, now, they make them available to our pilgrims when we bring them there. Unlike communities where we are having such a, almost a plague, and people leaving, beautiful women leaving their vocations, no longer calling themselves Brides of Christ. Here, they have never lost a professed sister in 700, 700 years. years. See, for us, this is very much like Mother Angelica. What we see here is a joy among these ladies, and they're telling us that we can be very happy. We're fully habited. We're cloistered. We're able to work with the animals with our full habits on. They do. They till the soil with their habits and on. They're successful. Mother Angelica and her group of nuns have probably the largest influx of vocations that we're having in the United States right now. The cause for her beatification began in 1309, less than a year after Claire died. It went before the Pope in 1318, but the actual canonization did not take place until December the 8th, 1881, with more than 300 miracles attested to 
and accepted by the end of the investigation in 1333. Nothing was done until 1881. Because of the troubled times, what with the Pope fleeing to Avignon and the Great Western Schism, Claire's process was hindered in show. But we know and have an expression. When God wants something done, no matter how powerful the opposition, he will have his way. And so it was with St. Clair of Montefalco. It's very interesting <clears throat> in that Montefalco is only about 10 miles from Assisi. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet most people have never heard of St. Clair of Montefalco. They confuse it with our St. Clair of Assisi. But St. Clair of Montefalco is such a strong Augustinian saint. She's been a sign and a symbol in her community these last 700 years. And when we bring people, they fall so in love with St. Clair of Montefalco that the, there has been a great devotion to the saint. I once said on a bus when we were leading a pilgrimage, I don't want any crosses. And a nun came up to me and scolded me rightfully. And she said, I beg for crosses. In this time, when our Lord is so abused in his Holy Eucharist, what cross can we carry? What cross can we carry to make up for all the hurts he's suffering? Jesus has a cross for you. Don't only take it. Embrace it. Adore it. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.